Well, good morning, church, and we've made it to part 10 of our series, and we really hope that you've gone back and you've caught up listening to the sermons, or if you don't mind being behind, you can go to the Monday morning messages. I believe it'll be about part six uh, this particular week. What they're doing is taking the sermons and trying to shorten them down and recap them. Uh, they won't be the same. You won't get all the information, but it might help you catch up a little bit that way. But you need to be there to handle this one because we're going to give you a new word today and a new fact. And it's going to be a little hard for some of you to process, but facts are facts, and therefore we have to deal with them. Speaking of that, in your Bible, there is a passage called 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. So since it, that's a fact... Let's read it. Let's look at it and then start dealing with how this verse, these two verses work. It says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Well, that is pretty rough, actually. No matter how you look at it, that's a stark thing. It leaps right out at you. So let's back up and just do a little bit of digging and scientific exploration here. The word church here is ecclesia. And ecclesia doesn't just mean church. It meant any gathering, whether it was a community secular gathering or whether it was a, um, a, a religious gathering, even a Jewish gathering or the like, any gathering such as that, that's a part of a Greek culture, was that uh, the community, democracy, the people gathered to make decisions. And every secular community decision was made by the gathering of the community. We see this a few times in the book of Acts, where secular groups are, are out. In fact, one of them even turns into a riot, and it too is called ecclesia, because they had been called out to make decisions, and they just happened to make it via riot in that case. Women were not allowed to speak at those meetings by custom, by the local authorities' pressure on them. Generally speaking, that was all that it took. Now, in some cities, that was not true. Every so often, women could speak, especially if they were women of substance, such as one that was running a very important business that brought in a lot of income into the community, or if they were, of course, you know, married to a Roman official of some standing, but that was still rare, to be honest. We find ancient writers uh, before and after Christ, such as Plutarch, Aristophanes, Sophocles, Democritus, alias Aristides, and, and other writers, spoke of the silence of women being the glory of women. That being silent somehow elevated them. And they often wrote as well as the impropriety of women speaking in public. Paul challenges these conventions. Paul does not agree with the conventions elsewhere in Scripture. He challenges them. Such as in Galatians 3.28 when he says there's no more male and female. We're all the same here. And also in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, verse 5, or verses 11 and 12 of chapter 11, when he talks about women praying and prophesying, and it's right there with men on the same level as men. And in chapter 14, they're also busy in the church, speaking in the church, singing in the church, delivering a word in the church, until you hit that massive big rock of verses 34 and 35. There's a real challenge in reconciling this passage with Paul's approval of women praying and prophesying in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4 through 13, or of approving of them of having a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation in chapter 14, verse 26 or his statement to the entire assembly that all can prophesy. Remember the prophesy did not necessarily mean to tell the future. At least 75% of the time it meant to preach publicly, to speak in tongues or to say amen throughout chapter 14. 
Well, this is a massive rock that has hit scholars so hard, they've got four different ways of dealing with it. One is the way that many of you were raised in, and that is Paul required silence of all women in all assemblies of the church. The second, Paul required women to be silent in some qualified sense. Third, these verses cite a false prophecy by a self-proclaimed prophet in the Corinthian church or the area. Or four, these words were, here's a new word for you, these verses were, an interpolation. Interpolation means insertion of words into the text that were not in the original document. We have many examples of these in our Bible. There are about 22 widely accepted interpolations by scholars. In other words, they agree these weren't in the original text for a variety of reasons, and the arguments are really, really good on these. But if you want to come down to the overwhelming majority of scholars, there are at least eight, if not 12, that the majority of scholars say this The evidence is clear. These passages were not in the original. Now, I don't like to put all of them into the same basket. I like to split them into interpolations and additions. And that may be a bit pedantic, to be honest, but I'm going to do it anyway. Additions are things such as the story of the adulterous woman in the book of John. It was a story that does sound a lot like John, and it sounds a great deal like Jesus. It seems to be a very early story. It was not in any of the earliest manuscripts, but when it did show up, it showed up and was firmly accepted by the early church. Those are additions. An interpolation is generally something which you have off written in the margin, and then it comes back in to the text somehow. We'll talk about that. There are going to be, to help you, In the description box for today's lesson, not only will you get the notes, which we provide for free, and they're not time limited. You can go back and get notes from whatever we've done. We are providing a couple other documents that are a list of interpolations that are generally accepted or widely accepted as being interpolations. So that you can have a look at those in case after today you start getting nervous about your text, and I don't want you to do that. You do, know, however, need to be aware that humans copying text, things happen. And it's not as if you're looking at this wondering, well, is this the original or not? Here's the deal. All my life I was told that the original manuscripts were completely perfect and without error. But that is completely a statement made on faith that the Bible never asks you to make. It never asks you to make that. Our manuscripts, our oldest manuscripts, are copies of copies of copies. They are really reliable, and they are really good, but they are not perfect, and they don't agree with each other in some points. I am able to look at the Bible, respect it, love it, use it, and have it be an incredibly useful guide in my life and my faith without demanding of it something it never claims for itself. Now, Let's take a look at these four views. What about the first view? That Paul is absolutely requiring silence of women in all parts of the assembly. Well, that seems to be very jarring, and it is contradictory to chapters 11, earlier in chapter 14 as well. It is contradictory to Galatians 3. To one chapter or verse or a few chapters earlier and later to contradict himself seems very, very unlikely for Paul. He was a very smart fellow, And I don't think he wouldn't, he would have let such a mistake or contradiction get past him. Remember that Luke, Paul's companion, records Acts 2 verses 16 through 18. We often ignore Acts 2, and we really shouldn't. We really ignore chapter 1 of Acts and how it flows into chapter 2. We'll get to that in just a bit. But in chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on, in those days, and they will prophesy. 
Well, Luke, Paul's companion, is the one who penned these words, quoting the, the Old Testament prophet Joel. So it seems that Luke wouldn't do that, and Paul would not be unaware of a contradiction he had written. So um, I don't think we can hold the one. I don't think we can say Paul is saying that no woman can speak ever in the assembly. What about the second idea that Paul required women to be silent in some qualified sense? The problem is, and I've read extensively, I've searched extensively, no one can tell us what the qualified sense is. No one. And Paul certainly doesn't. No one can tell us what chapters 11 and 14, how those are qualified, but then no other speech is. Or Paul's speaking of informal and formal worship in those two chapters. He's speaking of where women can contribute in prophesying, and it's men mentioned in context in chapter 11 with the Lord's Supper. That they can pray and prophesy, and he flows right into the story of the Lord's Supper from there. That's the context. And in some churches, women aren't even allowed to say a prayer or, pa or to stand up and pass the communion trays if you're in a Protestant denomination that does it that way. By the way, we mentioned last week was Giles of Rome or Giles of Colonna and mistakes that the, the Catholic Church made because of Pope Boniface VIII and Giles and such. We do need to come back and kind of square that circle a little bit and say, if you go to a Catholic church today, you will find that women participate in worship rather extensively in most parishes. They read scripture, they give prayers, they offer blessings. So a lot of that has been fixed by the community, shall we say? But are we saying that they can speak in some ways, but not in other ways? Well, we looked in chapter 2, where the prophecy says they will prophesy. But have you ever taken a look at the flow of this passage? Chapter 1 of Acts. In chapter 1 of Acts, whenever you... Take a look at verses 12 through 14, let's say. Uh, we'll just do 13 and 14. Uh, when they arrived, this is the group, the apostles going to Jerusalem, as Jesus said, right before he ascended, saying, going to Jerusalem, the Spirit will come upon you there with power. So they go. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together continually in prayer, listen to this, along with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Move on down, because now they're going to pick Matthias to, to replace Judas. And so then they come back to the story, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Who's the they? Well, it's the apostles that were mentioned, but also the women and Mary. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them. Who's the them? Go back to Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and it includes the women and Mary. So what qualified sense would you come up with here? I don't see one. Some, by the way, uh, the third says that chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verses 34 and 35, refer to a false prophet uh, speaking out. But there's no mention of that here, uh, in fact, I read one book where the entire argument was that just means that false teachers can't speak out. Well, when are false teachers allowed to speak out? That's never. Some say that women were being disruptive and asking questions, but again, this passage doesn't just limit it to that activity, it says silent, not speaking. So the third idea. And this one has, on the surface, some merit. Is that this statement 
about being silent is not from Paul, but rather from a false prophet at Corinth. Now, here's the thing. A lot of the book of 1 Corinthians and a bit of 2 Corinthians does work that way, where Paul is answering statements made there or questions they are posing. Perhaps one of the easiest ones to deal with is, uh, he says, you have heard it said that it is good not to touch a woman. So that's a phrase that they were using. They were teaching, it's good for men not to touch women. And he says, but I say, let each man have his wife and each woman have her husband. And that kind of statement rebuttal, statement rebuttal does take place in 1 Corinthians. That's the reason 1 Corinthians was written, was to deal with statements being made in Corinth. However, it doesn't fit the pattern of statement and response. In fact, and here's something you really, really have to do for this to set in. It disrupts the argument. It doesn't make an argument. Paul would make a state, uh, one of their statements and then respond to it, and it all flows. This is a great big rock that disrupts the whole flow. I want you to read 1 Corinthians 14, that back section, without reading 34 and 35. And you're going to find out something immediately. It flows much more naturally, much easier. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks they're a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. And he goes on, flow. If you read it as it is in most of your Bibles, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord people. Women should be silent in the churches. Wait a minute. He's talking about cacophony. Too many people at the same time. Two or three prophets trying to preach at the same time. It's different people trying to lead different hymns at the same time. And all of a sudden, he's banging out there to talk about women, and then what coming back to... It doesn't flow. So that's where the word interpolation comes in. You ready? Western style text, the manuscripts that we have that originate in the West, verses 34 and 35 aren't in this place. They come after verse 40. It still is a bit jarring, but it allows Paul's argument he's making before verse 34 to flow and be finished and made. They don't show up here, they show up later. Well, okay. The fact is, the manuscripts do vary. And a lot of the Eastern manuscripts don't even have these verses for a while, for at least a couple of hundred years. People made notes on manuscripts. And when people copied the manuscripts, sometimes the notes made its way into the text. Why? Excellent reason. Excellent question, rather. Because sometimes they were supposed to. You see, a scribe would copy a text, and then he would go back and check. And I say he because it was overwhelmingly a male uh, occupation. Or a team would go in and check. And if they found an error, you couldn't erase and start again. It's all about how they wrote. They wrote in uncils, which means everything was a capital letter. There were no syllable breaks. There were a number of letters per column. And so no matter where you were in the word, you stopped and you went back to the other line. And that's if you're doing Greek and that's if you're doing Hebrew. And I'm doing it from your side. Because uh, Greek is left to right, Hebrew is right to left. And then a certain number of the letters and a certain number of lines. And then you stopped and went to the next page. Papyrus was monstrously expensive. The book of Romans that Phoebe took and, wrote and read, um, read to them. I'll get the, the verbs out there in a bit. Uh, vowels are new to me, evidently. Whenever she read it to them, that taking that book was many thousands of dollars. It, papyrus was expensive. And it also decayed quickly. That's why you had to make copies when you could. So if you made a mistake, they had no eraser ability the, the closest they would get to it is a stone, but that would wipe out the whole area and often tear the papyrus. 
So they much preferred, and it was common, common practice, to put the correction in the margin. They would also put textual notes in the margin. And they would also sometimes put an exclamation. For example, in one of the Gospels, it talks about Jesus being resurrected, and the, the copyist just put in the margin, behold, like this is so cool, that got put into the text. Uh, most of them are like that. They, they make no real big difference. Some of them are more problematic. I'm a convinced, committed Trinitarian. I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal in all aspects. And yet, the verse that's most often used as a killer verse to, to prove that, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, is not in the earliest manuscripts. It is certainly an interpolation, worked its way into the text later. We usually spot interpolations by a couple of ways. Several, actually. Uh, the first is to check the other manuscripts. Are they in there? Second, does it fit the word usage of the writer? Does it sound like Paul, John, Peter, Luke? If it doesn't, then that's a little warning. Does it interrupt the flow of the text? That's a big, big issue as well. Is it an unnatural or contradictory passage? If so, it is investigated to see, does it belong there? Now, some of you are already looking down the road, and you're going to already have figured out that I want to tell you that verses 34 and 35 are an interpolation. And many of you are going to think, wait, this is some strange new teaching. It isn't. Many, many top evangelical conservative scholars have been saying this for hundreds of years. More recently, think of Gordon Fee, F-E-E, -E, a very conservative evangelical scholar. He has written extensively that 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 are not Paul's words. They are an interpolation. They were placed in the text later. Why? Because the evidence overwhelmingly testifies to this. It explains, by the way, also, why it doesn't sound like Paul. It has phrases Paul doesn't use. It interrupts an argument. It seems contradictory uh, to what Paul has just written. And it also seems unnatural. And we can do textual checks. We can even date when the interpolation occurred. It was placed in during the second half, I'm sorry, the first half of the second century. Again, when copyists did their work, they'd go back and check. They'd put these in, in the text. Now, I'm going to do this with my hands. If you're on a podcast here, just imagine. Or actually, it would be uh, beneficial, I think, for you just to Google Bing or DuckDuckGo, whatever you use. Uh, look for images of biblical manuscripts. And you will see the columns. And you will also see that there are margins. Those margins were absolutely part of the rigor of writing, that the margins had to be consistent. You will sometimes see interpolations written off to the side or textual notes off to the side. That's not the big issue. I want you to think, here's a column. Now, a textual note is put on the side. Well, on that column, it would have stretched from about verses 36 through 40. That's why where to put the interpolation varies. In the Western text, it puts it after verse 40. In some of the Eastern text, it puts it where we have it now. But here's the thing. It's always been known as a problem. The Codex Vaticanus, one of the oldest complete manuscripts we have, pretty complete manuscripts we have of Scripture. Seriously, one of the maybe three, top three, oldest authority. Here's the Scripture, the best we have. Has it marked this passage as a textual variant? In other words, this does not show up in many texts. It is a variant. The two oldest surviving or critically used, let me explain what I mean. Surviving, you know what that means. Critically used is when early writers refer to a manuscript as authoritative and ancient, but we don't have it now. But by their descriptions, we know a lot about it. So the oldest surviving and critically used 
text that we have don't have verses 34 and 35 in there. They just don't. By the way, the same text also don't have the story of the adulterous woman in John chapter 7, verse 53 to 8, verse 11. Every scholar agrees that was added later. I truly don't know of any scholar who doesn't believe that. Or the longer ending of Mark. There are a few scholars that still argue that that was original, but there is just no argument to be made there. It was added later for reasons that we went over. If you will go to the midweek Bible studies, when we did just Jesus stories going through Mark, and we did the longer ending of Mark and explain that. So you can go back and look for that. That's already done. We don't have another 35 minutes to do it here. Why, why were these verses added? Why do they show up in different places? Well, both passages have a lot of textual variance within those two verses. Both use words atypical of the book's author. Both interrupt the flow of the passage. In the marginal notes, the scribes knew that there were a problem, and so our earliest manuscripts have little dots, bars and dots called sigla, or signals, indicating this is a problematic text that doesn't have backing, manuscript backing. Even Origen, one of the, um, and by the way, if you don't know that name and you look him up, it's O-R-I-G-E-N. Origen, one of the great early leaders of the church, stated his belief that the Septuagint was corrupt. In other words, the copies that they had of that were already corrupted. And it, people asked me yesterday even, why do we have so many translations? Because it's frustratingly difficult to translate them correctly and to deal with the variants. So does that make me not trust the Bible? Not at all. But it makes me want to have four or five different versions before I make a call. For example, the NIV, which I generally use, the NIV of 2011, and I really, really love, it has some problems. In Genesis chapter 2, for example, it absolutely with zero manuscript or linguistic backing or right changes the order of creation. Because in chapter 2 of Genesis, God makes Adam, then he makes the animals, then he makes Eve. And NIV, wanting to smooth that over and make it match cha uh, chapter 1, says he had made the animals. And then he approaches Adam with, and no, the only reason they did that was to resolve an apparent contradiction. My response is, the Jews knew that was there all these years and didn't have a problem with it. I don't either. Let it be the story told the way the manuscripts told the story. And that's a version that I really, really like. So have several versions. The odds are wonderful that you're going to get the proper story if you read several versions. And besides, remember, we are not saved by getting everything perfectly. We are saved by following a perfect Jesus. So don't, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus didn't say, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in the books and believe in me. No. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He didn't say to the apostles whenever he was leaving them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to some books some of you are going to write later. No. He said it was given to him. Remember that. The Bible brings us to him. And for that, we are always grateful. We will always cherish the scripture. Moving on. St. Victor, who is the Bishop of Cadua, uh, ordered the text of 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, rewritten and moved out and put back into the margins of Codex Fuldensis, which is one of our oldest manuscripts. And that was in 541 AD. In 541 AD, they, already, they, had, they were still looking at those two verses as mistakenly put into the text. For 500 years, even though they'd gotten into some text, it was known, mark it with these sigla, these dots and bars, mark it, and then some said, just get it out. Victor made these adjustments, which meant he'd already seen older manuscripts where the verses were not included. Clement of Alexandria, verse, uh, he lived about 150 to 215 A.D., 
so an old guy, 65 back then, was you were, you'd done something right to live that long. Clement of Alexandria, one of the most prolific writers and preachers of the early church, commented on and preached on every verse in chapter 14 except verses 34 and 35 because they weren't there when he was preaching. The Apostolic Fathers quoted 1 Corinthians more than any other epistle during the 1st and 2nd century A.D. And by the way, I was going to name them here, but then I thought, why do you care? Then you can look them up online, and there are dozens of them, and so to keep this under an hour, we really needed not to. So look up Apostolic Fathers. They quoted 1 Corinthians more than any other epistle in the 2nd century A.D., None of them, zero of them, commented on these two verses. Why? Because they weren't there then. The first of the ancient fathers to mention the passage is Tertullian, who we've already seen was horrifically anti-women, who looked at women and said, you should shudder that you are an Eve. You are the source of all the poison and all the sin. And I, that guy. Around 200 A.D., he mentions the passage, which means by that time, at least one manuscript had it. But the majority did not, or St. Victor, of Cat uh, Bishop of Cattawa, in 541, would still not be marking it as a variant that needed to be very cautiously removed from the text but put into the margins. We could go on for hours. We really could. I probably read 10 to 20 books per sermon. <laughs> Uh, but you don't need to be put through that. So let's wrap this up. These verses contradict Paul's teachings in chapters 11 and 14. Yeah, 14, the same chapter in which the verses are included. It contradicts the rest of 14. They also interrupt the flow of Paul's argument. And here's another one we've not brought up yet. They include the phrase, as the law says. Okay, number one, Paul never uses that phrase in any other book. Two, there is no law. In the Old Testament, there's no law like this. So are we talking about a civic law? Maybe, but we can't find it. It is absolutely possible that in Corinth, there was a local rule that women were not to speak in the public gatherings. That's possible, but really doubtful because Corinthian women were kind of known for being boisterous and noisy, uh, very much like in Ephesus. And again, ladies, I'm not criticizing you or being anti-women. I'm saying in that society, I just don't see that they could have had a local law and there's been no law found. So what is he talking about when he says, as the law says? Well, you know something? Somebody who was listening to Tertullian and a few of his ilk might have thought it was the law and made the marginal note that eventually gets placed in. Plus, Paul always lifts up the downtrodden. Here, he would be committing a subgroup and make them unable to fully participate in the life of the church. That just goes against his character as well as his teaching and his record certainly blows up Romans 16 and elsewhere. And it seems also to be absolutely, completely unknown to the church for at least 150 years and to most of the church for up to 500 years before manuscripts began to be more and more copied after the surviving ones that had it in it. Now, once again, when we say this, we sometimes get people that are terrified, thinking, well then, how do we know that any of this? Well, let me just tell you a brief story. I know I've gone long, but give me a few more minutes. My father, when I was in high school, went over to Israel and went to the uh, Museum of the Scrolls, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he, with his Bible, and he was using the American Standard Version of 1901, just in case you wanted to know, and read the Hebrew off the copper scrolls and read Isaiah. And I can remember the phone call he made back home because my dad did not call long distance. And back in those days, kids, a call from another country 
um, another state, but even another country, cost five or ten dollars a minute, and your wages would probably be about 150 a week at those and, and those days. So this for my my Highlander father to uh, spend that kind of money was a shock. A, a phone call has come from Dad in Israel, and he was talking to my mom, and she was you know tears and such. He said, "We've got the book." In case we ever doubted, the words in my Bible are the words on a scroll. Yes, and there are very few. Think of it, only about 22 are either widely accepted or pretty much accepted. And of those, only 8 to 12 are absolutely, these are interpolations. None of them will affect your salvation. None of them change the character of Christ. None of them affect are asking, seeking, knocking, coming to Christ, being saved by faith, and that not of ourselves, that is a gift from God. None of them affect that. That's beautiful. That's brilliant. I was reading a scholarly book just yesterday that left out words and left out letters and words and messed up punctuation a couple places. And this is a, a book that has been read by... I would assume hundreds of thousands because it's a scholarly book, but it's written for people who aren't scholars. So I enjoyed it. Little mistakes. We get this. That's why there's second editions and third editions. I just got the New Testament by David Bentley Hart, who is an amazing scholar. Second edition. Why do you need to do a second translation? Because people told him, you made an error here. I think this word would have been better translated there. And he's very upfront about that in the introduction. The introduction is worth the price of the book right there. And it's a great translation, by the way, if you don't have it. Uh, and you probably don't. Uh, I'm aware I might be an outlier. Don't let this undermine confidence in Scripture. I would say, in fact, this should bring more confidence to Scripture because it shows the community is at work studying, doing exactly what we're supposed to do, rightly dividing the word, handling it correctly, doing like the Bereans, checking to see if these things are so. That way, when a variant is found, it's caught. So we turn our eyes to Jesus. We focus on him. And if we walk with him and walk with the spirit in our daily lives, Romans 8, we don't need to fear interpolation or any other issue with the text. None of them need impact our walk with Christ, our service to the downtrodden, the forgotten, the lost, our behaving like our Savior, so that one day we will be with our Savior forever. I hope you've enjoyed this. Next week is a wrap-up and more of a lesson on, all right, since this, now what? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, know that we love you. If you need us, info at rsafeharbor.com. Go in peace.